First, we'll take a look at the Windows XP boot process. In the XP boot process, the very first thing to occur is to post or power on self-test. During this process, the CMOS and BIOS settings are read. The second thing to occur is the master boot record, or MBR, finds the active drive, bootable partition, and reads the boot sector. The third step is the boot sector loads NT loader, or NTLDR. The fourth step is NTLDR, that is the bootloader, loads and switches from real to protected mode so all memory can be adjusted. It finds and loads ntdetect.com and it reads the hidden boot INI file. This brings us to the fifth step, the hidden boot INI file. This presents a menu of available operating systems to boot and tells NT Loader on which partition these operating systems are located and where it may find them. Sixth, ntdetect.com checks for and initializes devices and passes control back to NT Loader. Seventh, NT Loader then loads NTOS kernel exe, passing it the information from ntdetect.com. Eighth, the HAL DLL, or Dynamic Link Library, is loaded and device drivers are loaded from HQ Local Machine System, as well as other components stored in the registry. HAL stands for Hardware Abstraction Layer, and it is an intermediate layer between the operating system and the hardware. Ninth, hardware profiles are loaded. Tenth, registry settings are loaded, that is, the remaining registry settings in the registry hive. And finally, eleven, when logon exe is executed and waits for the system logon ID and password. We've looked at the Windows 7 and uh, Vista boot process in the BCD data store, but Windows XP is, uh, you know, it, the boot process is something completely different. So let's take a look at that. And once again, I'm going to open up my computer. And once again, although it looks a, a bit different, you'll want to go to Tools, Folder Options, View. And remember that, you know, all of these files would be hidden unless we change the default settings. So, I mean, you don't have to do this, but I like to display the full path in the title bar up here. That's kind of neat and useful. And then this would be checked. So you'd want to change it to this, show hidden files and folders. All of these would be checked, and you want to uncheck them so that you'll be able to see hidden files and file extensions and protected operating system files. And finally, this option will be checked to use simple file sharing. I would just unselect that so that way the security tab will appear, and you'll be able to edit permissions. Okay, so with the settings in place, if I go here to the C partition, um, I can see my hidden boot files are appearing here. And one of the main files is NT loader. And then after that would be the boot INI file, you know, as far as booting the operating system. And these files are usually going to be on the root partition if you only have a, a single boot installation. If you have a multi-boot installation, it's possible they may be placed on another partition and you may have to root for them or find them. But in this case, um, I'm using a single boot configuration. So they're here on the C drive. And let's just talk about kind of, you know, what happens and the way things load. So the very first thing happens, we, you know, when we power on the computer, it goes to the post, to the power on self-test, it loads to CMOS and the BIOS settings. Then it goes to the master boot record. And the master boot record accesses the first active hard drive and whatever sector, you know, whatever boot sector is on the uh, active hard drive on the partition that that operating system is, is pointed to by the master boot record or MBR. Okay, and then that would access NetLoader, NT Loader. And then NT Loader would read the boot INI file. And the boot INI file, um, unlike the BCD data store in Windows 7 and, uh, and Vista, is just a text file. You could actually open it up in Notepad and edit it. And so you can look, and you know, in this case, um, I threw in some you know, different boot entries just to show you what it would be like. But the way it reads, um, you know, basically the, the syntax of the boot INI file would be as such. This first value here, multi, is um, you know, whether or not it's the first or second or third hard drive controller. So if I had multiple controllers, you know, I might have two or four parallel ATA or IDE or EIDE controllers. Um, I may have two or four SATA serial ATA controllers, either way. But in this case, so this, you know, this would be the first hard drive controller. And then this disk option here specifies, um, you know, whether or not um, you're booting from a SCSI hard drive. And in this case, we're not, so zero, it's off, all right? And then our disk here, our disk here says, you know, use the first hard drive. So remember that you don't start at one with computers, you start at zero. So zero would be the, you know, the very first hard drive. And if I had, you know, hypothetically, let's say that I had IDE, EID, parallel ATA, and I had two PETA drives daisy chained on the same controller, then the first drive would be R disk zero, and the second drive would be R disk one. 
Understand? Okay, and then the next one is the partition. And in this case, now this doesn't start at zero, but this would say use the first partition um, on the drive, in this case the first drive, right? So first partition there. And in this example, this is, you know, the default is the default selection in my multi-boot menu. Okay, so in this case, you know, Windows XP would be the one that is selected and, and pointed to. And then that would point to NT Loader, and NT Loader, you know, once it read that from boot and I would go back and start loading other files. My timeout is, you know, only 30 seconds. That's the amount of time I have to choose my operating system. Let's let's go back and review this for these entries real quick once again. Okay, so um, Multis has used the first hard drive controller. So on one physical controller, you know, the first hard drive controller, all of these entries are located. And then this next entry here, disk, is you know used only when booting from a SCSI hard drive. And in this case, it's zero, so that's that's turned off. And then our disk would be the first hard drive. Well, this hard drive, all of these operating systems are on different partitions, but on the same physical drive. So our disk is going to be the same all the way down. So it's the same drive controller, multi-zero, and it's the same physical hard drive, our disk zero. Okay. Now, although it's the same controller on the same hard drive, the partitions are completely different, right? On partition one is XP Professional. On partition two is uh, Windows 7 Ultimate. And on partition four is Linux Ubuntu, all right? Those are those operating systems. And these are just some, you know, switches or command line options that can be thrown in. You know, fast detect, you know, execute. Um, but that, that's how you would read the boot INI file. That, that's how NT Loader reads the boot INI file. Okay, so, you know, once it's figured that out and figured out the partitions and the configuration, it can then load the operating system that the user has selected. So, NT Loader, Boot INI, very important in the boot process. Um, and then the next thing that happens is it would load Boot Sector DOS, and that's usually in the root partition, and that would be used to load another operating system in a dual boot environment, you know, if we had a dual boot configured. Um, you know, we don't in this case. Yes, I added the menu entries as an example, but I have not actually installed those operating systems yet on those partitions. But if I did, then depending on what I was loading, you might also see bootsect.dos, okay? And then the next thing that it's going to require is ntdetect.com. You can see here's ntdetect.com right here. And um, in this case, um, it would help with detecting hardware and, you know, go into real mode. Um, the next thing that would happen then is that it would load NT boot DD sys, and that's only required if you know. I mean, if a SCSI drive was connected and we were you know booting from a SCSI device, but you know in this case we're not. It's parallel ATA EID, so we don't need that file. We don't have that file. The next very important file would be the NT OS kernel uh, exe, and remember you had the same file on Windows 7 and Vista. And it, it's pretty much in the same location. So a lot of the configuration files, as a matter of fact, are on Windows and System32. So I'm going to go there, just like they are in Windows 7 and, and Vista. And inside System32 here, let me go here, look for, bring up folders, and all right. And then I'm going to just do a quick search here. All right. And here's NTOS kernel.exe right here. So, you know, a very, very important file in both Windows 7 and Vista and also in, in the Windows XP loading process. And then also similar to the, the Windows 7 booting process, after NTOS kernel, the kernel exe file is loaded. That's the core component of the operating system, uh, you know, and kernel services. It would then load HAL.dll for the hardware abstraction layer. And this sort of is the intermediate um, you know, middleman between the uh, the hardware and the operating system you know, with the device drivers and, and kind of plug and play works in there. But how DLL? Let's see if I can search for that real quick. We'll just look for how. There's how DLL, all right, and see Windows System 32. Okay, and then after the how DLL file loads, remember a dynamic link library? It's it's like a suite of functions that multiple programs can access or use. Um, then NTDLL would be loaded, okay? And this is, you know, basically an intermediate service. Um, it provides support for functions along with how DLL. And I'll just do a quick search for that too. Let's do, let's load NTDLL.DLL. Uh, All right, and there, that's also Windows System 32. 
And then finally, there are several files that load that are core components of the Win32 subsystem. All right, for 32-bit applications and programs and services. So, and I'll just look, look for or search for these files here. So, one of the first ones would be Win32K. Do let's do 132k. There's 132k sys. One of the next ones would be kernel 32.dll. Let's look up kernel 32 there. There's kernel 32.dll. And one of the next ones would be add vapi 32. Dot dll. All of these dynamic link libraries here that everything in Windows uses. User32 DLL. And finally, um, GDI32 DLL. So all of these dynamic link libraries would load. And then once that's done, um, you know, the, the system, you know, the registry hive, the registry database would come up. Remember that that holds, you know, like all of your device driver configuration settings, hardware settings, user preferences, um, all of, uh, you know, a lot of the settings, you know, and, and all the configuration information about the operating system itself, which device drivers need loading and startup, and that would just basically be in the Windows System32 config directory. So let me pull that search down, but you know, Windows System32, and then if I went into config. All of these files here, and let me put, let me just list that. All right. So again, all of the registry information that we would need to load and bring up, and then device drivers, and again, that's located in System32 and drivers. And also remember, if you go into the, you know, I mean, we'll look at all the dynamic link libraries, DLLs, and sys files here. So there's all the drivers. And then if you went into the etc folder, remember that that's your host file for layer three. Um, you know, IP address mapping to a host name and the LM host uh, file for NetBIOS names. Okay. And then after that, the device drivers, um, you know, basically the operating system will be up and loading. And the only other thing is possibly maybe the paging file might be accessed if there wasn't enough, you know, random access memory. Remember, that's for virtual memory or, you know, basically your swap file if you don't have enough RAM. But that's that's kind of in a nutshell that you know all of the files involved into the Windows XP boot process. And in addition to going into the recovery console and using the recovery console tools that you would load off the XP professional CD, um, there are several graphical tools that you can utilize to manipulate and manage the boot process of the operating system. So let's first right click on my computer. We'll go to properties, and I'm going to go to advanced and start up in recovery and click on settings and although I could edit entries manually in the boot INI file here in notepad I could also use a graphical menu here and I could pull down and simply select my default operating system Windows XP Windows 7 Ubuntu you know whatever I wanted to load there and I could also set the default timeout again what do I want to happen in the event of system failure automatically start or not do a kernel dump so there are several graphical uh, settings that I can set there. Um, remember that I can control the services that load automatically boot up if I right click on my computer and go to manage and services and applications. And I can double click or right click and go to properties. Either one doesn't matter. But I could choose whether or not something starts manually, automatically, it's disabled, it's enabled, start it, stop it. I can also view its dependencies, which are the other services it depends on to run. So if it's not, something's not running for some particular reason, I might check the dependencies tab and make sure that all of the services that that particular item depends on are also running. Otherwise, that might give me the right tree to bark up to try to solve the problem. And in addition, of course, there's msconfig, just like you have with Windows 7 and Vista. So if I load the msconfig tool, I can go through here and do selective startup, diagnostic startup, normal startup. Here's my startup tab. I could disable all and just, you know, that would be great for speeding up the boot process on my computer. Would not un uninstall any. Thing. Um, the programs would still be there, but I'd simply have to manually click on them instead of them loading automatically, which would be great because then my operating system wouldn't load so fast and take so long. And do you really need all of that garbage to start automatically? No. Um, and you could always go back and change it if you know something didn't work the way that you liked it. But I kind of like things in manual mode. 
I just like it to boot up. And that's also, if you had something that was loading automatically that was causing problems, causing Windows not to boot or finish booting or boot properly, then you could disable that here and get a more simplistic and streamlined startup by disabling that. But of course, you can also modify the boot INI file right here and choose these options. And these will add command line switch options and advanced options if you want to look at those, the timeout. That can be edited. There are other tools available. Um, services, you have access to services here as far as you know what would be started. Win INI files, which are text-based configuration files, the same thing with system INI, and then general, again, over here. So, um, you know, just several, several nice graphical tools that would help you configure the Windows XP boot process.